Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm uh, Professor John McKean at the Captain Astronomical Institute here at the University of Groningen. I'm also a, a staff astronomer at the Netherlands Institute for Radio Astronomy in Davingelo. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this uh, public lecture on um, citizen science and the data avalanche, which will be given by Professor Stephen Sargent uh, at, from the Open University in the United Kingdom. Uh, this talk is, of course, done in collaboration with uh, the people in Studium General, so we'd like to thank you for all the help you've given us in, in setting this up. Um, so as the title of today's, or tonight's talk suggests, um, we as professional astronomers are on the cusp of realizing massive data-intensive projects that will reveal the wonders of our universe, from exotic phenomena like gravitational waves uh, to things that go bang in the night and then never return. Um, but the data volumes are incredibly, incredibly large. They're uh, mind-bogglingly large. And we require novel and innovative ideas to how to process those data sets. And there's sort of several me methods that are being proposed to solve some of these issues, some of these massive data sets. And in fact, we have a, a major conference going on in Groningen right now with 150 astronomers from all over the world coming to try and solve those issues. Some of them are here, here this evening. And um, tonight, we're, what we're going to do is we're going to hear some of uh, these fascinating astrophysical discoveries that this community is trying to achieve, and how you as the public uh, can actually contribute for becoming citizen astronomers. Um, as part of this evening, there'll be the opportunity to ask questions uh, to our speaker. Um, but also, afterwards, everyone is welcome to join us downstairs for a, a borrow and some snacks, where the members of the public can talk to some of the astronomers here about some of the things that we're doing. Um, and yeah, so our talk tonight is given by Professor Stephen Sargent, who is the Open University's Professor of Astronomy. He's specializing in starburst galaxies and gravitational lensing. He did his doctorate at the University of Oxford, and after that he had research positions at Imperial College London and also at the University of Kent. Um, he leads projects on science dissemination, public engagement, and citizen science, which we're going to hear about this evening. All right. Stephen. Thank you very much. Good. <laughs> Good avant. <laughs> My Dutch is slightly rusty, so I'm going to continue in English, if that's all right. <laughs> so let's see if I can turn this on and start this up. Boom. Can you see something? Marvellous. Hooray. Brilliant. So, <laughs> so we are in a tremendously exciting time at the moment in, in astronomy. Um, in fact, in science in general, we're enormously fortunate to be alive right now because we are in a transformative moment in science. And it's because of the avalanche of data. And it's not just the sheer volume of the data that's coming, it is also the complexity of the data. And it's so complex and so big that it is a problem just to ingest and understand all of this data. And this is a real challenge in science. So uh, the scientific community uh, can't do this on their own. Uh, so they need the help of members of the public to, to understand the data. And so there has never been a better moment to get involved in scientific discovery than now, because there is this great explosion of data. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, also, at the same time, artificial intelligence, machine learning, has had an enormous growth. And so it has become possible for machine learning to rake its way through the data. And so then the, the, this, this begs the question, what can the machines do that the humans can't? So is this actually going to turn, uh, make scientists obsolete in some sense, right? Are, 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 uh, are we really going to need to employ human minds to rake through the data? Uh, what does it, in fact, mean to be a scientist? What will it mean to be a scientist as the artificial intelligence grows? And so what I'm going to talk about in this talk is the growth of artificial intelligence and how it uh, links to the, uh, 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 the citizen participation in science discovery and what it means to be a scientist. And although I won't answer the question directly of what it means to be a scientist, I I hope it will give you enough information to come to your own informed view about what it means to be a scientist. But uh, 
I, I, I'm going to start off by, um, I'm going to come down a bit because, gosh, it feels very, very distant out there. So I'm going to start off by, by posing, this, let's see if this works. Oh, bingo, <laughs> posing the question, what does a scientist look like? So you've all probably got your own um, thoughts as to what a scientist should look like, what a scientist does look like. Uh, you might be interested to know that this question was posed of 12-year-old children uh, in the US, and they were asked to draw their pictures of scientists, and they drew. <laughs> and I look at those, and I think, I know some of those people. <laughs> Um, but then they went to a visit to Fermilab, and the same children were asked to then draw their pictures of scientists. And these are drawings by the same children here, and they came up with these two. And, you know, this is completely, completely different. I know some of those people as well. And I, and I love it, though, one of them says, sup, y'all. I don't know if you can see that there. But so, so uh, the point being, this was just a one-day trip by some kids to a scientific research institute. And this has transformed their picture of who scientists are. And this, this underlies the importance of just a little bit of uh, engagement with pr the professional science community can have a transformative effect on a person's perceptions on science. And this is one reason why citizen science is so very, very important, because it brings people into direct contact with the scientific community, and it's, and it's so important for us as a scientific community to dispel these myths. So, structure of the talk. I'm going to talk about how the Zooniverse happened. The Zooniverse is, I, I, I would say, the premier um, uh, citizen science research platform in the world, and it's a, a fantastic place to explore all manner of scientific experiments. And it is the platform that we use in the Asterix projects. And so we are here, and many of us are here, for the, uh, the Asterix Horizon 2020 uh, multi-messenger astronomy project. We are all engaged in coordinating huge astronomy international facilities all over the world uh, and chasing gravitational wave bursts and fast radio bursts and all kinds of magnificent, wonderful things. But as part of this project, we also uh, funded citizen science projects. So this is to get people, members of the public, actively engaged in the process of scientific discovery. And the platform we used is the Zooniverse platform. Now I'll explain where this came from. Um, I'm going to talk, also talk about the data avalanche and machine learning. So these are the things I, I talked about at the very beginning. There's this huge avalanche of data that we have. Uh, and also, then I'll talk about the synergy between humans and machines. So let's start off with a story of how the Zooniverse happened. And it started off in this paper in 2007. There was uh, this provocative article on whether the universe has a handedness. And I'll show you what it, I mean by this. So someone looked at uh, the, uh, the clockwise and anti-clockwise spiral galaxies, and they counted the number of clockwise ones, the number of anti-clockwise ones, and they reckoned there was an asymmetry across the sky, so there must be some sort of handedness to the universe. And I looked at that paper and thought, no way, that, that, that just cannot be the case. This, this, this must be a problem with the data analysis, and there were problems with the data analysis. Um, so, so I had it on my whiteboard for a while, uh, examine a million galaxies by eye, and I thought, well, I'm never going to do this, really, really. But, but it was there as, wouldn't it be wonderful to do? But there was a team of uh, uh, scientists in Oxford who had a much better idea to how to approach this, and that was to ask for volunteers to help. So the task is to classify nearly a million galaxies as left-handed or right-handed spirals. And they reckoned it would take an expert three to five years, even if they're working full stop, full time, non-stop, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. It's multiple years of work. So, well, that's why it stayed on my whiteboard forever, right? So there was no, no chance it would even make a dent of that. So they thought they'd get maybe 20,000, 30,000 volunteers. You know, if you're really optimistic, why not? But in fact, a hundred thousand uh, volunteers made forty million classifications, super fast. And this project 
was just scooped up by the by the, uh, the, the popular by the by the public and 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 done, and so there was this fundamental discovery that there is a huge appetite among members of the public to participate in scientific discovery, um, and this is the the rich seam of discovery that has been mined by the Zooniverse ever since. So um, I've, something else we did in the Asterix project, fund some videos. I've got a, a cartoon video here of the, uh, the creation of the Zooniverse. So this is another hairy moment for the talk. We'll see if this actually plays. Okay, it's playing. Is it going to show the sound? <laughs> 60 second adventures in collaborative science. <laughs> Number one, citizen science. Since the study of science began, it's been expanding and evolving faster than you can swipe left. Today, scientists are using technology that would have blown the minds of their predecessors. But the problem is that things like our swanky new telescopes mapping space are producing so much information that even our swanky modern computers can't handle it. Then, in 2007, Chris Lintott and the team at Galaxy Zoo had the idea of asking volunteers if they could help sift through images from space. And it worked. People from all over the world helped out and not only classified and even discovered new galaxies, but spotted and named other astronomical objects as well. This project soon became a collection of projects, the Zooniverse, ranging from decoding ancient manuscripts to spotting penguins in Antarctica. All you need is an internet connection, and everyone in the world can become a collaborative scientist. Now that is mind blowing. <laughs> Bravo. Okay. Does anyone recognise the voice there? By the way, ah, <laughs> one or two nods. Um, it, it was David Mitchell, I should say. So he he is a, a comedian in the UK, but I don't know how much purchase he has internationally. Anyway. Um, so I think this is a good point, a, a good moment to get across, uh, I think, the most fundamental point if, if, of this whole talk. So if there's one thing I'd like you to remember in this talk, it's the following. It is that citizen science is not outreach. Okay. So, I mean, it can be outreach. It can be the scientific community just sort of splurging their knowledge out to the, to the public, but actually, really, that's not what citizen science is. It is a tool for doing science. It is a, it's a magnificent thing. It's a, like a biological computer, a parallel processing computer of people volunteering their mental CPU to, uh, to do complicated uh, classification problems uh, for, for science, because the science is fundamental and important and interesting and worth doing. And that's what citizen science is. It's not, it's not, just, uh, uh, it's not just outreach. So I'm going to whisk through some examples of Galaxy Zoo, uh, of, of, of the Zooniverse. So it started off with um, Galaxy Zoo. It has uh, now uh, 77 million classifications. Oops. Uh, it's been tremendously successful. It's been, uh, there's been spin-offs for uh, looking at Hubble Space Telescope data at... Uh, well, a whole range of uh, lots of different data. Um, this is a lovely plot. This is a plot of the, 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 the size of the contributions of individuals to, uh, uh, to the Galaxy Zoo. So each block is one person's contribution, and the area of the block is the number of classifications they did. So you can see there's uh, a whole bunch of people who contributed a tiny amount, and there's a few absolute stalwarts who uh, do about half of the um, uh, half of the classifications? Now th that balance is not the same for all experiments. Some experiments it's a much more even mix, but with Galaxy Zoo there were just some people who fell in love with the projects and just poured some time into it. And you know, as scientists, we should be very very grateful that people are doing this. It's it's it's, it's marvelous. Um, and in terms of the amount of discoveries that were made. Uh, there are, okay, whenever you start a scientific experiment, you've got a pretty good idea of the sort of discoveries that will be made. You know that you're making a new measurement, so you'll find whether the universe is A or B. Either way, you found out something, right? Um, so in the case of the handedness of the universe, uh, you could find out whether the universe really does, is, is clockwise on average or something, and turns out it isn't. 
But, uh, uh, but I mean, that's a scientific result. So that was one of the expected scientific results. But there was a whole bunch of uh, significant papers from the Zooniverse that were completely serendipitous, that were unexpected by the, the science team uh, beforehand. And this is one of the nice things about citizen science. It has the scope for doing this. Um, one of the things are green P galaxies. So these are galaxies which uh, the volunteers uh, classified as green peas, because they, they, you can see, right, they, they kind of look like green peas. And what's going on here is you've got a, a small galaxy. Uh, it's, it's close to the resolution limit of the telescope, so it just looks like a blob. And uh, it turns out it's got a lot of star formation going on, and that star formation is giving off uh, uh, some particular uh, light at particular wavelengths, emission lines. Um, uh, like, a, like a fluorescent light, it gives off very particular uh, 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 wavelengths of light. And that falls in a particular filter which makes the galaxy look green. And so you have these little star-forming nugget galaxies, which uh, uh, really is it's a new class of galaxies. It was un unexpected, uh, but it was a discovery by the Zooniverse. Uh, another one is this weird thing here. This is, um, it was... Uh, a weird sort of bluish blob that was spotted by um, a, a, a Dutch school teacher, I think a biology teacher, called Hanny van Arkel. And uh, she, okay, so she gave it a Dutch name. I, I, I apologize for anyone who speaks Dutch here. It's, my pronunciation will be ter terrible. It's something like voorwerp. means th a thingy, I think. So, yeah? An object. It's an object, yeah. So, uh, and, and it, she saw this and didn't know what it was and, and discussed it in the discussion boards and, and, uh, and the project team didn't know what it was either. It was followed up with the Hubble Space Telescope and it, and it looks like this. And the thinking now is, uh, what we're seeing is uh, there's a galaxy at the north, at the top rather, um, and inside that galaxy is a supermassive black hole. And at one point, this supermassive black hole was accreting gas and dust from its surroundings, and it, was, it had become luminous. It was heating up all the stuff as it was falling in, and it was uh, turned into a quasar. And that quasar was blasting out lots of ultraviolet and optical light and illuminating a clump of gas down below. And that accretion stopped. But that... Um, like a sort of a dying ember, this, 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 this clump is still radiating. So we're seeing an echo of a dead accreting black hole, a dead quasar. So this was, this was very cute. And these, these are very, very rare events on the sky. But when you're trawling through millions and millions of classifications, you can pick out these wonderful rare events. And this is a particular strength of citizen science. It's one of the reasons why citizen science is great for scientific discovery. And uh, Hanny Van Arkel, uh, well, she became quite famous, actually, at least in the citizen science community. Uh, this is a picture. I don't know if you recognize these two fellas from, uh, from Queen. Uh, Brian May is actually a very keen astronomer. He's actually presented. Uh, he's been on Sky at Night in the UK and all sorts of things. And so as a result of that, Hanny Van Arkel got to meet Queen. And you know, it's, and it's, it's one of these fairy stories of citizen science. It's, it's, it's just it's glorious. Uh, so, I'd like to now just say briefly what I think, or what, we're, what the Zooniverse team thinks motivates a citizen scientist. Okay. For a citizen science experiment to be successful, it needs to do these things. It's, uh, the, the questions are, how easy is it? Is it um, are you doing something really complicated and mathematical and it's a really hard work, or can you just sit back on a bus and flick through stuff and classify things easy? So if it's easy, it's a successful experiment. How beautiful is it? It's got to be attractive. It's got to look wonderful to the participants. How important is it? This is a really, really important thing. So this is why citizen science is not out outreach. The science question must be worth doing. You should be able to explain to somebody that uh, uh, the, the science that is going on, and that, that person has got to buy into the idea that this is, this is a worthwhile way of spending time. Okay. How much, is it, how much am I learning? So people participate much more in the citizen science experiments when they are learning uh, stuff, when there's educational resources. And also, how famous could I get? 
So if, you, if you've got a, 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 an exoplanet project, for example, like, you could be the one person to discover this exoplanet uh, around another star, and you could become famous, or you could discover a pulsar, or you could discover all sorts of things. And people participate. It's, a, it's, it's like a, the entertainment of playing the lottery, I suppose. You, you, you don't expect a, a, a profit, but you know, oh, if you, if you won, it would be just so fantastic, and that outweighs it. So uh, here's another example of a citizen science experiment. This is one that we've funded in the, uh, uh, the Asterix project. This is classifying variable stars in a big telescope project called SuperWASP. The idea is you've got stars that are pulsing and uh, doing strange behaviors, and what you, you look for the pulses, and then you put the data, you, you're monitoring these stars, and you put the data sort of in sync with the pulses. And so these are the, the pulses that you see. And the idea is to classify the shapes of the pulses. And I, I, I'm showing this also because it's, it shows that uh, you can have citizen science experiments that are really quite abstract, and there is still an appetite, a big appetite, to participate in, um, uh, 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 in, in these sorts of classification tasks. As, um, but not all tasks are very abstract. There's a, one of my favorite experiments is called Penguin Watch. And the idea here is, uh, there are a bunch of webcams out in Antarctica, and the ecologists there want to, to know the population of penguins in Antarctica. And this, because it's important, because the penguins feed on the, I think it's the krill, and the amount of krill is important for fisheries, it's important for ecology, I mean, it's, 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 you know, it's economically important, it's important for understanding global climate change, it's important for ecology, it's all sorts of things. Um, so, it is an important project, and it's a beautiful project. So what you're being asked to do is click on the penguin and click on their eggs. And, and it's, just, it's, just, it's just so cute. It's wonderful. And, 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 it's, and it's been enormously successful. There's another project, Old Weather. This is uh, old, often typewritten, sometimes handwritten weather logs from a century ago. It's very hard to get a machine to do this reliably, so you get human volunteers to transcribe old weather logs. And you know, this again, it's very important for climate change. So this is a fundamental uh, uh, science, and it can really only be done reliably by humans, by crowdsourcing. Um, there's another uh, citizen science project, which is based on disaster response. Uh, and the idea is, to use remote sensing data, satellite observations, and uh, before and after some uh, 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 a catastrophe. So like a, a typhoon hits or a, or a tidal wave or something like that. And then the volunteers can see where the damage has happened, and then they can uh, use this crowdsourced information, send it to relief organizations, and the relief organizations can target where the help should go. So this has a real human impact. This is very, very important. So here's a, an example of um, uh, uh, locations. It was a few years ago of, of where there are current um, uh, natural disasters being monitored. And this is where the, the citizen scientists are living. And if I flick between these, you can see there's a pretty close anti-correlation. So, so people are... Uh, it, it's, a, it's an overseas development project. It's, people are helping uh, uh, the uh, um, uh, low-income countries. It's I, I, you know, on a human scale. This is this is very very important stuff. Okay, so next I'm going to talk about um, the data avalanche and machine learning. So a lot of the talk in our conference uh, at our Asterix meeting has been about the scale of the data arriving. And one of the biggest data projects is, uh, is this facility. It's being built in Australia and South Africa. It's called the Square Kilometer Array. And uh, it's a big radio telescope project. It'll be looking for uh, the, the uh, signatures of the first stars that, ha that were created after the Big Bang and doing a huge range of science uh, besides that. And the evolution of galaxies, of strong gravitational lensing, of, of, of um, pulsars, many, many things. But the data that comes from this is just 
gigantic. So I've got a, a headline here from a few years ago, from uh, uh, 2011. So it's talking about the 2011 internet size here. The SKA telescope to generate more data than the entire internet, okay, by 2020. And it's just, just so huge. And I think this is the, 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 the data per year. So, so it's, a, it's a huge problem. And, and so the, the square kilometer array is in part a computational project. Uh, so dealing with the, the vast volumes of data. So um, the, the, there is a lot of interest in, uh, uh, I'll rewind. So the, uh, uh, even the processed data will be huge. Okay, so even after all of the data processing, there was still an enormous volume of data. So there is, a, there is interest in, crowd, in crowdsourcing the, uh, 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 the, uh, the, the reduced data that comes out of this. Let me try this. <laughs> this is my work. So, um, so there is a project called Pulsar Hunters. And this is, uh, the, the idea is to look for uh, pulsars. So these are neutron stars, uh, sort of the dead relics of stars, that are spinning extremely fast and, and, and sending uh, a beam of radio emission uh, like a lighthouse. And uh, as, as the star spins, you get a flash of radio light as the beam sweeps across the Earth. And the idea is to look for these pulsars. And again, a very abstract data set. So this is... Uh, again, this is, again, it's, we would call it a phase-folded light curve. So it's, it's synced with the pulses and the uh, frequency along this axis, so the, 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 whether it's uh, short wavelength or long wavelength um, uh, radio waves. Again, uh, uh, the, the people are being asked to look for horizontal and vertical features in this picture. And to me, that's, again, a quite an abstract uh, classification task, but still it's been lapped up by the citizen scientists. There's another huge data science project, and that's the, uh, uh, the Large Hadron Collider uh, at CERN. There's a picture of CERN here. And uh, the future Large Hadron Collider will have a, a high luminosity beams, and the data rates will be just gigantic for that again. So I've got a, a graphic here of um, the, that's the Large Hadron Collider in 2016. This is the square kilometer array in, phase, uh, in its phase one. This is the the, the data rate of the high luminosity Large Hadron Collider in the future, and then the, 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 the final square kilometer array. Uh, I've got the entire Google Internet archive there of 2018, so you can see the Internet's grown a lot more, but even so, the, the, the data rate is just, just horrendous. So again here, there is a, a data processing problem, and even after all of the processing, there's still an enormous amount of data to mine. And this is where citizen volunteers can really help. So there is a project, a Zooniverse project called Higgs Hunters, based on the Atlas experiment on, in, 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 uh, in, the, uh, in the LH. And the idea is to look at the particle tracks in this particle accelerator and to classify the vertices. And you're, you're, you're looking for rare events and just, just on the chance of finding a new, uh, probing new physics. So they're looking at the data that would otherwise be um, uh, thrown away because it's just, it's just, uh, there's just there's a low chance of having some uh, new discovery science in it because it, it is just so much to, 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 to rake through, but it's something that citizen scientists can do. So there's a, there's a, there's a real chance there that uh, something tremendous could be discovered there. Another um, big science project is the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. So this is uh, taking images of the whole sky very quickly and looking for flashes of supernovae and all sorts of uh, uh, time domain events. And to describe this, I'm going to need to teach you a little bit about machine learning. So this will be my, my subtle segue into machine learning. So the idea of machine learning is, is based on this idea of a, a neuron, or you could call it a perceptron or whatever. But it's, it's basically, we think of it as a black box turning... So, um, some inputs, some numbers, into an output, often one number, usually one number, okay? So uh, what you do, what goes on inside this box, not so important, I and mean, there are lots of ways of doing it, so, so it really doesn't matter. Uh, but the idea is you have lots and lots of these 
uh, boxes stacked up, you can have lots of inputs coming in, which are all sent into the first layer of these neurons, which then spit out their outputs, and that can be sent into the next layer of neurons, and so on, and then spat out into some outputs. Okay, so now that's everything you need to know about uh, uh, neural nets. Uh, and it's inspired by, um, by biology, so it's inspired by how brains work. And it's a way of turning all sorts of complicated inputs, it could be images, it could be all sorts of strange data sets, into something comprehensible. And what you do is you use uh, a, a high performance computing or you use a, a graphical programming unit, processing units, and uh, you use computer, com computer technology to optimize these neurons, wiggle them around until your inputs give you the sort of output that you want. And it's a way of creating computer programs that, or evolving computer programs that uh, uh, do exactly what it is that you want. So for the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, there's a particular sort of uh, technology I want to show you. It's called a recurrent neural net. So you have an input going into your neuron, and it creates an output, okay? But then, here's the cunning thing, the output gets sent back into the neuron, and then it changes the neuron. Okay, so you've got a changed neuron now. So then it'll get its next input, it'll send the output, and that output again gets fed back in. And again, that changes the neuron. Okay, so what, what's happening is that the neuron is sort of acquiring a memory of what's been fed into it. Okay. So, uh, so what you can do is, it's, it's, so this means you've got a machine that is remembering what's happened beforehand and is responding to the inputs depending on what happened beforehand. And this is exactly the sort of technology that is used in speech recognition with Apple. So when your phone is waiting for, hey Siri, okay, it's got one of these uh, recurrent neural net tech running all the time, and it's just waiting until you start saying, hey, and then it picks its ears up, and it starts changing its, its configuration. You say, Siri, and, it, and, it's, um, and, th and then it will have recognized it. So there's a very, very a similar technology that's used to uh, recognize the death of stars, exp uh, stellar explosion, supernovae. So what I've got here is uh, time along the, the bottom axis here, and there are two different measurements here, two fluxes. Uh, it'll be a green flux and the red flux. So it's taking images of the sky in the green light and red light. And at some point, there's a supernova explosion and you get a very characteristic brightening, okay? And what we've got here is, that, is what it thinks the classifications are in real time. And as the flash starts happening, there's a, the classification probability for a stellar explosion, a supernova 1A is a shot up. This is, this is classification happening in real time. And this is um, uh, uh, the machine learning, some of the machine learning technology that is being used to uh, detect uh, the, the, uh, these big stellar explosions. And it's very important because once you've spotted the explosion, you can use all of your other telescopes and zoom in and, and, uh, and study them and lots of other wavelengths and study them. And then you can, uh, it, it opens up a whole range of new, of new science. And this is called multi-messenger, multi-wavelength astronomy. And it's one of the specialisms of the Asterix project that's, that we've been talking about this week. So I've got another video for you. And hopefully this one will also play. And this will be about, well, hopefully it will be about multi-messenger astronomy. 60 second adventures in collaborative science. Number three, multi-messenger science. Imagine a world where every new discovery was a closely guarded secret. A frustrating world where human progress would be severely limited. This could be particularly damaging for modern science, where one group not being aware of an important discovery by another could hold back scientific understanding in general. Which is where Asterix comes in. A European Commission project to connect research teams so they can share data and information quickly and easily, far more than a punctuation mark. 
A great example of this collaboration is in investigating fast radio bursts. This isn't a standing you get when you're adjusting your radio, but a random flash of radio noise which only lasts a nanosecond. So it's only with scientists across the world working together that we have any real chance of working out what these radio bursts are and where they come from. In addition, by building a community of scientists and citizen scientists, one discovery can lead to many more, which is good news for the human race. Okay, so I'd like to um, uh, introduce you now to a, another machine learning technology. It's called generative adversarial nets. And the idea here is you have a competition between two uh, machines. You have a machine uh, called a generator and a, a discriminator machine. So what you want to do, what the, the idea of this is to uh, have uh, a robot that creates simulated data and you've got a, a robot, you're training to, uh, to see if you can tell what's fake and what's not. Okay, so I've got a picture of a cat that's been generated and a real cat and they pass through the uh, discriminator and the discriminator can tell the difference. Okay, so I've got a, so it tries again and it's, it's worked a little bit harder and it's still got a picture of a cat and it's still not that good. And uh, so they pass by the discriminator and the discriminator says, nope, nope. And then picture of the cat gets a little bit more sophisticated, a little bit more realistic, and it passes by, and the, um, now the discrimination is having a, a bit of a harder time. So this technique has been used to generate, uh, uh, make computer-generated images. So uh, a few years ago, this was from 2014, a research group used this to make computer-generated images of faces. And... This is, I mean, to me, it's, it's quite amazing that these are all artificially generated faces. I mean, they're, they're, these people don't exist. But I've got a shocker for you, okay? This person does not exist. <laughs> this, is, this is actually from a website called thispersondoesnotexist.com. <laughs> uh, and so these are, this is the quality of the faked images that exist now, and to me, it's just, just astonishing. So, actually, I'm just awed by that. Um, so you can, you can browse this website, and you start getting a feel for what the computer is doing and what it's not doing. So it's, basically, what it's doing is it's recognizing textures and reproducing textures in images. It doesn't really have a good sense of three-dimensionality. Of, of objects. So here you've got a, a, the background. Well, it knows what on average a, 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 a background should look like, but they're not objects. They're not physical objects. And what is this going on there? That's, there's a lot of these weird burn features. Um, they also, it also doesn't understand hats very well. <laughs> hats and headscarves and things. They sort of merge into hair in a weird way. Um, it's, it's not, like I say, it's not understanding three-dimensional objects. It's just recognizing texture. Um, it also doesn't understand earrings very well. It's never, they're never symmetrical, and eyes are often asymmetrical. So that's, that, that's often... And th these things are worth noting, right? Because uh, I think it's important to be able to recognize faked images. Um, uh, so here's another one where it's muddling up um, a hat and hair. And, but what the hell is coming out the side of her head? <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's very strange. Um, sometimes the images are really very, very startling. But if you can see, again, it's, it's muddling up um, uh, 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 jewellery texture with skin texture. It's, it's, um, but still creating quite a very arresting image. This is the image that really spooks me. This is from a different website, whichfacesreal.com. And so you're, there you're being asked you know, which one is the real one, which one is the fake one, and this is the first one that fooled me. So this, for me personally, is, is a, it's, it's a spooky image. I should really have spotted there's a little deep learning burn somewhere up there, but uh, 
Uh, somewhere in there, it goes a little bit wrong, but uh, oh, 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 yeah. <laughs> so I've got a quiz for you. Um, one of these is painted by Rembrandt, and one of them is a fake created by machine learning. So what do you think? So um, hands up if you think it's the image to the left, which is the fake image. That's the Rembrandt, do you think? And how many people do you think it's, uh, this one is the fake? Wow. That one is the Rembrandt. It's a <laughs> Amazingly, this one to, on the left is, is the fake. And it's a, such a good fake. It's just extraordinary. So uh, there's a website on this, nextrembrandt.com. There's a lot of dot .com in this. Uh, I think it was a Microsoft research group that, that did this. It's a lovely analysis of, uh, it's not just um, reproducing texture, there's a lot of analysis of how Rembrandt paints the shape of his paintings, the shape of his faces, and so on. Um, there's also, um, uh, there's a, there's a, this fakery extends to text. So there's a website called inspirobot.me. And what it does is it generates inspirational memes automatically with natural language processing. <laughs> so uh, this, yeah, uh, sometimes it comes up with stuff that is, it's just, it, gosh, yeah. <laughs> it, you know, th this, this could be, this, uh, I mean, it, it bears no relation at all to the picture. I mean, they never bear anything, because it's all randomly done, but sometimes it hits on something. And it's because, actually, the, um, the mathematics, the logic of grammar is not that complicated. So you can fake up sentences without too much difficulty, and you could just put random nouns in and random verbs in, and it's, it's not so hard. Um, I saw this one. I, <laughs> I thought, I like that one. I'm, I'm keeping that one. <laughs> um, but uh, faking up language isn't where it ends. So uh, there is a research group that created automatic text that was so realistic that uh, you can't tell whether it's a, um, a polemical article by a human being or whether it's automatically generated text. And this, uh, the, the AI for this, often the machine learning stuff is made publicly available on a big website called GitHub and other, other repositories, and GitLab and so on. Uh, but the, the, the machine learning for this was kept secret because it is it's potentially dangerous because you could imagine an army of these bots on social media channels uh, and being, making provocative statements and manipulating conversation and people would not be able to tell whether they're, 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 they're humans or not. So, I mean, there are real ethical que with, questions with uh, uh, machine learning. Okay, so that's, uh, I, I hope I've, I've wowed you a bit by the, uh, the, the, the capacity of what machine learning can do. So now I want to tell you about the synergy between humans and machines. Uh, so I want to reassure you with some things, firstly, that machine learning can't do. And one thing machine learning can't do is take a step back and go, that's weird. So... <laughs> All right, so clearly there are no robots in there. <laughs> or if there are robots in this audience, then, uh, you know, uh, you're, you're really, really top-range robots. So you can imagine now a facial recognition algorithm just going over faces in a crowd and, uh, or a gait recognition algorithm or something like that. But you see an image like this, you know immediately there's something funny going on. And you can take a step back and you can say, oh, wait a minute, there's, there's something else going on with this data. And in fact, I've already given you an example of that. There is this uh, uh, Hannes Vorwerk. This is this uh, weird blob that someone just went, took a step back and said, well, that's not a galaxy, that's, that's something weird, and then triggered another process. And robots can't do that. They don't have the capacity to come to these sorts of decisions. We're a long way from a, a very general sort of machine learning that can, do, that can do anything like the human mind. There's also... Um, uh, the rare object problem. So this is from another uh, citizen science program called Snapshot Serengeti. So you've got some cameras in the Serengeti, and the idea is to monitor 
the wildlife population. And so you have li uh, lions, I was going to say lions and tigers and bears, but you're not going to get tigers and bears. But anyway, lions and zebras and all sorts of stuff. Um, and to a degree, you can train machine learning to recognize some animals. Uh, but then what about the very, very rare animals? And this is an example. It's called a uh, zorilla. Uh, no, I have no idea what a zorilla is, except that's what it looks like. But it is so rare that you can't get a big enough classification set, a good, big enough training set to train your machine learning to recognize it. So the only way to get this population is to ask citizens to trawl through the data sets. Okay. So this is something that is uniquely uh, useful for uh, contribution from human beings. Another thing that AI can't do is actually just collect raw data. And here we have a, a, a project called um, the Cosmic Ray Extremely Distributed Observatory. This is a different sort of citizen science. This is people being active and, and, and a volunteering time and volunteering effort, but in a very different way. And the idea here is to uh, monitor uh, for cosmic rays from space using your mobile phone. You put your mobile phone on to charge, you cover the camera, and your, and your camera is just reading out all the time. Even though it's dark, it should be reading out nothing, but every now and then a cosmic ray will come from space and land on your camera and you'll get a little flash, and it will record the flash. And the idea is that uh, as you record flashes from cameras all over the world, if you see a big simultaneous splash of events, this could be a very high energy cosmic ray coming in to the solar system and uh, scattering perhaps off um, the interpla uh, interplanetary magnetic field or a particle in the solar wind or something and creating a shower of particles that lands like a wall of, uh, well, a very ephemeral wall. This is, <laughs> this is, this is subatomic particles, right? So, but, but it's a wall that arrives at the Earth and you get a big simultaneous splash on the, on, on the uh, uh, camera phones. Uh, and it's, it's very hard to detect this sort of event unless you've got a very distributed set of detectors. So this is a very different sort of uh, science experiment. So, yes, did you know you have an intergalactic particle detector in your pocket? So we have a, a video that was, uh, well, this one we didn't fund through Asterix, but it's so cute, I want to show you. It's so dramatic as well. So what it's going to show now is just the installation instructions for this. So I, I think I can skip through that. <laughs> so, yeah. So as I say, the idea is you have a particle. Uh, it could be a, a decay of a dark matter particle, creating a high energy photon, scatters off the, uh, the, uh, the, the interplanetary medium and lands like a big shower onto the Earth. Um, have we got time for another video, do you think? A 60 second video? So this, we made a, we made a, a funny video of a version of the, of, the, of the last one. 60 second adventures in collaborative science. Number two, messengers from space. Mobile phones are very useful if you want to chat to friends or annoy people in a theater. But did you know they're also intergalactic particle detectors? There's a very good chance that wherever you are, you're in a shower of subatomic particles from space. They're not dangerous, but they could answer some important questions such as what dark matter actually is. Many of these particles originate in the sun, but there's a chance that decaying dark matter could also create cascades of particles. We need a detector the size of the Earth to measure these massive cascades, which might have some downsides. But something that has already spread over the planet is the mobile phone. So scientists 
developed apps to turn camera phones into mini particle detectors. And the Credo project has gone further, linking up citizen scientists to spot these rare cascades of particles. And if enough people join in, then their mobile phones do become a global detector. Just remember to turn it off in the theatre. <laughs> if you enjoy it. So, we can, you can combine machine learning with humans. That's the, la the last thing I'm just, I just want to talk about before I finish up. And of course, obligatory image of the Borg. <laughs> so um, there was a project to look for strong gravitational lenses uh, in a, a big imaging survey called a Hyper Supreme Cam Survey. Uh, gravitational lenses, they look uh, kind of like this. You've got a foreground galaxies here, and you've got these background, you can see these little arky features. That's, those are background galaxies. And they're being warped by the, uh, the foreground space and time. So you've got a background source here, and you've got the foreground galaxy here, and, and you're seeing this background galaxy through this warp, this foreground warp. Okay. So I've got, a, I've got a, an animation of a background galaxy, or a background star. So uh, here's my background star. Okay. <laughs> So now I'm going to put a galaxy in front of him, and uh, I'll make the galaxy transparent so you can see what happens. So, <laughs> so now I'm going to crank the mass of the galaxy up, and you can see uh, 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 the effect of this. <laughs> it's a good look. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this is what it looks like in, uh, in real life. You've got these background blue galaxies and foreground uh, red galaxies. And there's, there's, the, the, the experiment is to trawl through uh, big data sets to look for these uh, characteristic features. And I'll skip through that. But um, uh, there, there's been quite an innovative approach to doing that. And that, that has been to combine citizen classifications with machine learning. So the citizens volunteer their classifications. And that, in turn, trains machine learning. And then the machine learning can, uh, can classify the, uh, the easy to classify things quickly. And then the citizens can refocus their efforts on the hard to classify things. Okay. And by combining machine learning with citizen classifications, it turns out you can get, uh, well, in the examples that have been tested, uh, a factor of eight fa a speed up in classifications. It's a tremendously important a piece of technology for citizen science. So citizen classifications and AI are really uh, synergistic. They, they uh, uh, benefit from each other. Um, there was a lovely project that we funded with Asterix called um, uh, Muon Hunter. The idea is you're looking at uh, charged particles coming into the atmosphere. They call, cause showers of radiation that come out in a cone and they, look, they land on the telescopes and look like rings. And you're looking for colorful rings. And in the first five days, we had 1.3 million classifications from this. It was just a huge appetite for doing these classifications. And now the team are trying to see whether they can uh, train a machine to do the same. And so there's a new citizen science experiment to see whether the machine has done it right. So are these mostly rings? Are these all rings? Are these not all rings? And so, uh, it, so we're asking whether the citizens can help us train the machines. And there's another big science experiment called Euclid, which will be transformative in finding these strong gravitational lens events. We think that we'll find uh, 100,000 gravitational lenses. Huge. I mean, that's orders and orders of magnitude more than we have now. But that will be among a billion others. So that's a huge data set to trawl through. And so we're trying to build machine learning to help us do this. And so there's a group that made these uh, beautiful simulated images. And so we've been training on these simulated images to see whether we can train machine learning. Um, but one person, one heroic person, uh, uh, his approach to this challenge was to visually examine absolutely every one of the simulated images. It was him, uh, his name is Neil Jackson, it was him and his postdoc, Amit, who uh, just, they had 48 hours to do it and they just plowed through the lot. They must have gone cross-eyed with this. So it was a really heroic effort. But 
They did not win. They did not win. The machines did better, and a lot of machines did better. We do not know why. Okay. So why are machines doing better than world experts? And we have another citizen science experiment in Asterix to try to get more humans on the case. Perhaps they just got tired. And so we have a, 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 a mobile app for doing this. Uh, this is a, a, a demo here that uh, we filmed. It's a bit like Tinder. So you can swipe left or swipe right to whether it's a gravitational lens or not. <laughs> So, uh, and uh, with this, we can hopefully find out what the machines are doing, or, uh, or whether machines are seeing the sky in a way that we're not. So I started off this talk by asking, what does a scientist look like? Okay, so I've got, I'm going to propose an answer to you. And you are what a scientist looks like. Okay, so I, and I hope that I've encouraged you to have a go at experiments on the Zooniverse. They're a very uh, wide range of things to do. All sorts of interests, so many beautiful and so many important things to do. And with that, thank you very much. <laughs>Thanks, Stephen. Um, so we have time for a couple of questions, but like I said, we we have a, a drink session downstairs where you can get to chat to Stephen uh, and a few of the other astronomers here. But is there any questions that anyone has at the moment that they'd like to ask? Oh, one at the back. Oh. Ethics. Yes. What happens with all the data? All right, yes. So you're asking the question about what is the ethics of the data collection in citizen science. So uh, every citizen science experiment has its own uh, uh, data retention, data ownership policy. So if you contribute data to the Zooniverse, it is your data. You retain ownership of the data. Okay. And the data, the classifications that are made in the Zooniverse are made public after a certain amount of time, after the, the scientists have had a chance to analyze the data. And the, the raw data, the classification data that goes in, that has to be public. So you're always starting on public domain data. Uh, so I think it's also very important that these questions are figured out at the start of an experiment. Uh, and it's a requirement of the Zooniverse, but um, in, this, in times of a wild west of discovery, then, then sometimes these things can get overlooked. So you're absolutely raising the right point. Yes, you do need to have a, a very clear statement about data ownership and data ethics. And also there's the application, there's another ethical question, the application of data, because you can deploy these wonderful classification technologies in all sorts of ways. It's a, yes, it's a double-edged sword. Yes. Any other? Yep. <laughs> you might need to re repeat that for the people in the yes, back. Yes, yeah, okay. so, so is it possible that one day AI can take the place of human astronomers? Uh, mm. <laughs> There's some nervous faces in the room. <laughs> um, I think we are still a very long way from machines having uh, uh, an everyday common sense to, so to, be able to be able to step back and say that's weird. Um, while that is the case, there is still um, a, uh, uh, the scope for, for having humans involved in the process. Um, as machines get more sophisticated, you will still need uh, people to decide which are the important scientific questions. So then, you, you know, you can ramp this up as, as you like. So then you could say, well, what if, uh, could, you, could you devolve that to a machine? Could you... Um, uh, uh, say, ask a machine what are the most important scientific questions. So, um, I don't know. I hope not. <laughs> so, uh, but but we are really quite some way from from machines being at that stage at the moment. So I'm not. I'll retire safely before. In fact, every, I think we will all retire safely before that becomes a very serious, credible question. So that's my confident prediction. <laughs>
Okay, if there's no other, oh, we have one more question, yes? Ah, yes. Do I know if there are citizen science projects in other fields, such as medicine? Uh, uh, off the top of my head, um, yes, there are. Yes, there are. So it's a different sort of citizen science experiment. There is a protein a structure challenge where um, what you have is I mean, protein the very complicated molecules. Um, uh, uh, they can fold in lots of different ways. And uh, it's a very fundamental problem in medicine to figure out the structures of proteins. And often it's done in, a, in an empirical way. You crystallize them and send them to synchrotrons and so on. But you could do it computationally. Um, and so there's the, there are uh, data sets that have been made available to the public to see if pu the public can find um, uh, uh, solutions to protein structures. And some people go at this really aggressively. They um, have uh, liquid nitrogen cooled rooms of their own computers, just spending their CPU time just to, uh, just to solve these things. Um, but there also the ethical questions are extremely important. So, I mean, that's, that's another case where you've really got to get that, that right. So yes, there are, there are some, but I think um, some of the ways of crowdsourcing that immediately come to mind, there are also ethical questions that would come to mind too. So, uh, but yeah, I, w I would recommend having a rummage at the Zooniverse because there's all sorts of stuff. Okay. Um, well, I think we can take any more questions and discussion downstairs where I think you as the public can already try and identify the astronomers in the room. Um, but well, uh, so let's just finish off by, by thanking Stephen. We have some, a little present for you to say thank oh. you. One of them's a... Oh my goodness, smart people tap water. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and, um, and we also have a book for you um, by a, a Dutch writer called The Discovery of Heaven um, by uh, Harry Mullish, and it's quite a famous book in the Netherlands, and it's, I believe this is the English version. <laughs> 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 anyway, uh, let's thank Stephen again, and like I said, you're welcome to come downstairs. Thank you very much. <laughs>